Thank you very much for this invitation in the first place. And my wholehearted congratulations to all those who have made this possible. I don't want only to congratulate you, I would like to tell you of my admiration for what you're doing for Chile. This is, as I said yesterday night, um, not, not the only case, but it is probably the case in which there has been more elaboration, reflection on subjects and on the possibility of incorporating people to these discussions. In Philadelphia, a couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure to be with a group of Chilean scientists coming from all over the United States to discuss their insertion in Chile as professionals and the future of science in Chile. Two months ago, there was a meeting of students, Chilean students in the Washington area, coming from different professions and uh, orientations, we had a very lively discussion on education and the reform of Chilean education. I cannot but celebrate as the representative of the Chilean government the fact that the Chilean community, Chilean civil society abroad is alive and trying to uh, attract, to get all the wealth in knowledge, in experiences that they can use to bring back to Chile. We have uh, yesterday heard uh, an extraordinary exchange on inclusive development or on development without exclusions, which means necessarily a reflection on the integration of society, on the always elusive search for a community, on the question in definitive terms of inequality. This is what I would like to reflect about today, uh, protected by the freedom that gives me to be in an academic setting. <laughs> I will not send a Twitter about this. <laughs> Somebody will. Uh, I, have, I have been uh, somebody who in a, in a, an academic life which has been interrupted mostly by politics and diplomacy, has always been interested more than in rational, informed utterances oriented towards the production of public policies, in the undercurrent beliefs reflecting states of mind, feelings, irrational reactions, prejudices, traditions and fears. What has interested me the most always has been ideology and the way in which people live without, with ideology without realizing it. Like the old French theater play in which the main character didn't know he was speaking in prose. Two weeks ago, Fernando Montes, who is the president of La Universidad Alberto Urtal, the Jesuit University in Chile, gave an interview in which he reflected on the class obsession of Chile. Class divisions which become culture and get into the psychology of Chileans up to the point that they cannot dominate feelings as a result of that. And he said that the educational reform in Chile was a battle on, for the soul of Chile. He referred to the conflict that exists, he said, in the essence of the definition of Chile. He reflected or he said that this battle for the soul of Chile almost defined our way of constituting the Chilean nation, the fight for inclusion. 
An unknown woman, a couple of weeks later, sent a Twitter. And she said that she didn't like the educational reform because, as a result, children would be mixed. That was a clear statement. That was about, uh, and you probably, most of you in this room, follow the Chilean press, a subject that is also excluded. It is like the elephant in the room nobody wants to discuss. The segregated cities, the segregated schools, the segregated churches, the segregated stadiums, the segregated regions. We have built a country which is extremely segregated and has developed as different worlds that do not touch each other except in conflict. This is not new in Chile. The history of Chile since the end of the 19th century, in which la cuestión social, the social question, became an important issue. The main question was, what do we do with the poor at the time? Has always been centered on the question of education. Obligatory school in the 20s and 30s became an extraordinary divisive issue between those installed in the left wing of the spectrum, particularly the Radical Party and the Liberal Party, and the Conservatives and the Church. Last week, uh, the, the, net, the net circulated a letter I didn't know from Gabriela Mistral, our Nobel Prize poet, criticizing strongly the positions of the church and the conservative party at the time and demanding obligatory education for children, primary education at the time. The famous ENU, La Escuela Nacional Unificada of the period of Allende, was also an extremely divisive issue. It was seen as a pretension of a socialist government to introduce Marxism in the, in, in the class room. But if you look at what, was, what the government wanted to do, in fact, what the government wanted to do was to coordinate primary education, secondary education, and have a national program established by a national uh, ministry of education, like France. But it was received as a brutal attempt against freedom of education. There were reactions that forced the government at that time to cancel the project in 1970, at the end of 1972. Now it's, the, now it's the educational reform in Chile, and the president of Chile last week said, there was a, she said, a, camp, a terror campaign against the educational reform. It has been published during the whole week. Why do we always get into this sort of irrational reactions when we touch the question of education and when we touch the question of balancing society or trying to get a more cohesive, cohesive society? Each time these attempts have happened, we have had profound political earthquakes, and our institutions have been threatened by instability and conflict. There are no studies that I know. I know that I can find elements of them in works by his Chilean historians like Gres, Salazar, even Gonzalo Vial among the conservative historians of the arguments for exclusion, which have been the arguments historically used in Chile to justify exclusion. 
I have been fascinated by recent studies explaining the way in which people in the 18th and 19th century, especially in this country, justified slavery. There is a recent book by Domenico Losurdo called Counter History of Liberalism, which I recommend to anybody who wants to see how liberalism always included the possibility to exclude people on reasons of creed, race, or gender. But the arguments for exclusion in Chile have evolved in a very uh, clear way since the beginning of the 20th century, in which they were basically established around the idea that nature distinguished between people and therefore rights were different among people. In pre-modern times, Miguel Leon Prado, a very important Catholic intellectual at the beginning of the 20th century wrote, Jesus teaches to the poor resignation in the suffering of their poverty and to the rich moderation in the enjoyment of their wealth. <laughs> and of course, this idea was the idea that organized uh, the reaction to any sort of attempt to modify social structures. Behind the religious argument was the concept that civilized people could mix with barbarians, barbarians. The social order needed the preservation of social hierarchies. And therefore, what we built in Chile was a society that looked permanently, or a political system that looked permanently, for an exclusionary cohesion. We needed cohesion, but we needed to exclude people in order to be cohesive. A change in arguments, of course, was established during La Cuestión Social. The urbanization of the poor in Chile produced necessarily a reflection from the political class on how to deal with this new massive phenomenon of the presence of the poor in the country. This period lasted until the 20s or 30s. The reaction was to say, charity has to be individual. Reform comes from the heart. Therefore, any attempt to change social conditions develops from, a free, from the free will of persons that are moved by their sensitivity in front of poverty. But any attempt from the state to correct society violates human freedom, individual freedom. That was the position of the conservative church, for instance, after the famous Rerum Novarum Encyclica of Leo XIII, which created, in the end, the Christian Democratic Party as a reaction to that. There were statements that, however, are extremely resembles, resemble enormously to what we have called more recently trickle-down economics. Listen to this, for instance. What is superfluous to the, to the rich should be the inheritance of the poor. That was a statement of the Catholic Bishops' Conference in 1920 the poor will inherit what the rich don't need. And this is basically, has become basically, one of the tenets of some modern economists in the world. Inequality, therefore, comes from nature, and then uh, the state shouldn't intervene. That was the position for a long time until the moment in which, as Robert Reich said yesterday, modern economics got into the picture. Modern economics got into the picture, as he said, forgetting what political economy was. And uh, as a result of the intervention or the entrance of modern economics into the picture, the subject of inequality tended to evaporate. In fact, Inequality tended to evaporate up to the point in which society itself tended to evaporate. 
I don't want and I don't have the time to go into a long analysis of what uh, orthodox economics introduced in the ideology, post post keynesian ideology. But I have to remember Mrs. Thatcher saying that, fa famously saying, there is no such a thing as a society. That is the most extraordinary expression of a vision in which the market establishes the freedom of individual to compete and therefore gives everybody the chance to have equal opportunities. If that is the main tenet of the economy that was introduced in Chile in, at the beginning of the 70s, but which began much before in the 50s, at the end of the 50s, with the agreements with the University of Chicago. If that is the tenet, therefore, there is no need to study the development of society or to consider the problems of society, particularly the problem of inequality. It is the market that will be able to develop uh, the possibility of equal opportunities and therefore will necessarily equalize society, giving chances to everybody. The introduction of this type of vision in Chile was done against another vision, which was at the time extremely predominant in our country and in Latin America, which is the CEPAL vision of the world. And it is important to, to, to mention this, because of course, academic transfers to Latin America coming from universities abroad have never been depicted as trying to confront uh, local thought or local developments. It is evident, I have to remember here, that uh, I wrote my dissertation thesis, my PhD thesis on the transfer that occurred between the University of Chicago and the Catholic University of Chile between 57 and the 70s. Uh, I have to say that the Ford Foundation documents at the time made clear that one of the objectives of this effort was to confront the theories of CEPAL, which wanted precisely to recuperate the idea of political economy, of a political economy. The idea that there might be some truths, economic truths, that were close to scientific uh, progress, but that were valid for most economies in the world, but that if you didn't consider the local phenomenon and the evolution of that particular society in terms of history and in terms of social, social development, this truth will never, would never work. I will say that no elite has ever in our history been more ignorant of history, politics, sociology, psychology, and political economy than the group that directed that experiment in Chile. <laughs> what they were, were extraordinary propagandists. And they managed to persuade and to create in society a concept of market linked to society in which uh, individualism, competition, and the elimination of everything public linked to state initiative was the rule. Let us come to the present. Why are we debating inequality in Chile today? This is not because of, I believe, public policies or intellectual elaborations. We are discussing uh, inequality in Chile because since the year 2010, thousands, hundreds of thousands of students went to the streets and showed to the country that the way in which education was being conducted in the country could, should not and could not continue. I remember that when I initiated my studies of uh, political sciences a long time ago, one of the books that impressed me 
was a book wrote by an American political scientist called Ted Gurr, and he, whose, whose name is Why Men Rebel. And what he showed was that there was something called relative deprivation, which happened precisely when people had the opportunity to aspire to new products and new possibilities of development. And that this relative deprivation produced rebellion when there was the belief in the justifiability of political action and was successful when the balance between the capacity to act of these people and the capacity of the government to repress or to channel anger was bigger than the pro capacity of the government to repress or to channel anger. We have in Chile, we have in Chile during the last 20 years doubled our income, even tripled our income. Ten years ago, 72% of the people who came into universities were people who had been there for the first time. Their families had never been at the university before. This produced the debate on inequality, and this produced, at the same time, the rebellion of the students in the country. Perdón, pero voy a tomar más ratito porque viajé desde Washington. <laughs> Then. Why was the debate admitted? The debate was admitted in the country because the imaginary of the elites felt threatened by the possibilities of losing control on the political system and on institutions. The educational reform, therefore, has produced in our country a debate in which there is a mixture of policy proposals, political propositions, political debate, technical issues, but at the same time there is fear, irrationality, a recourse to conventions, and a certain apprehension that the world will not be as it was in the past. This is why when I listen to people who say, we have to put ideology aside. We have to leave ideology out of the picture. Sometimes I believe that this is a mirage. Ideology will always be there. And our problem is how do we manage to introduce these reforms without producing the breaks and the crisis and the collapses of institutions we have produced in the past in our history when these initiatives have been taken. This leads me, and with this I finish, to the question of the quality of politics. The use of time in the reforms, the pretension to do everything at the same time, can become catastrophic in a situation of this sort. The pretension that participation should dictate politics, policies, excluding the possibility of having good policies, which have been proven elsewhere to have success, can also be disastrous. We have to make progress without generating regressions. And to those of us who lived the 60s, the 70s, and had to experience the military coup, the idea of preventing regressions is extremely strong, extremely powerful to us. Therefore, what we listened to, what we listened yesterday, what Jose Miguel Benavente and Robert Reich said, they discussed about policies and good quality of policies. They discussed about the redefinition of what the market means about a redefinition of the production of value in Chilean society. They discussed about good technical solutions to these problems. These discussions will be installed in good or bad political conduction. We need to make this political leadership good. We need to have good quality of political decisions, good participation. 
we need to understand that if society doesn't change, and if we continue like we are, then regression is inevitable. We might do good policies and prevent regression and prevent irrational attitudes in society. If we don't do nothing, we can be sure that regression is going to happen. I wanted to put these reflections in front of you because I know you are going to discuss this morning a series of issues which have, and following your own uh, speci specializations and your own knowledge in different areas, uh, you are going to debate on technical issues, on public policy issues. What I want you to consider is that politics is always critical to these decisions, and without good politics, they might not work. This is the message I wanted to convey. Thank you very much for listening to me.